welcome to another uh, instructional video from Metacoustics and today we'd like to talk about some new technologies that are available in auditory evoked potential systems and in particular the CE chirp stimulus as an alternative to click stimulus um, and or tone burst stimulus. And I guess our question is are we ready for chirp evoked ABRs? And um, are we ready to ride these new waves in uh, auditory electrophysiology? Well, the first thing that we have to talk about and realize is that all evoked potentials have uh, the same goal. They all depend on the synchronization of individual nerve fibers uh, so that they fire in a synchronous fashion. That gives us the strongest response, the response that is uh, most reliable, repeatable, and readable. The problem is that the cochlea itself has a critical timing issue. And everybody has seen this slide before. Uh, and we realize that if we look at the shape of the cochlea and realize that it has uh, sites that are sensitive to different frequencies. Uh, so, if a stimulus comes in that is of a low frequency, it needs to travel further to all the way to the apex of the cochlea before it uh, can engage the site that it would stimulate. Where the high frequencies travel a much less distance because closer to the base of the cochlea is the site uh, that they would stimulate. So, because of this, uh, uh, timing problem, ABR using the types of stimulus that we've been using all along is not as efficient as it could be. Uh, and we found this out actually when we were doing stacked ABR. Uh, and that was very effective uh, for getting a better ABR response, but it would be impractical. Here's how we did it. What we would do is apply a high frequency uh, and get a response, and then a little bit lower frequency, and then a little bit lower frequency, and then even lower, and then the lowest. And you'll notice that the response, the wave 5 response, actually appeared at an earlier place for the high frequencies, as you'd expect, and a much later place at the low frequencies, because they had to travel further to get to their destination there. Uh, site of stimulation. So when we add these up, notice that waves fives don't line up because they're at different places in time. And uh, so we add up what we have and we get a response. But in the process of stacked ABR, after we got all of these, uh, which were misaligned because of the timing, we would actually then uh, through an algorithm in the equipment, move all of the waveforms so that wave 5 actually lined up in time before we did the addition. And so there's a big difference between the actual timing of the cochlea and the shifted, when we, when we shift these before we sum them. And uh, notice that we get a response that is about twice as large as as we would get the other way. Now, of course, this would be very impractical for ABR testing, threshold ABR testing, because it would take too long. It, would, uh, uh, it, it just wouldn't be practical for that, even though it could be done. And we did it all the time in stacked ABR for a different purpose. Uh, but what if, instead of doing it that way, we did it a much more reasonable way? Instead of trying to synchronize the response, instead we synchronized the stimulation, the stimulus themselves. Okay? So here's the difference between a click and a chirp. In a click, all the frequencies are applied to the cochlea at once. Some of them have, part of them, lower frequency components have to travel further. Higher frequency components travel less. And we get what we get as far as an asynchronous 
or a dyssynchronous firing. Okay? Uh, look at that compared to the chirp. Now, this axis, um, the x-axis here, is a, um, an axis of time. Notice that the high frequencies uh, are here, mid frequencies, low frequencies. So we actually apply the low frequencies first, and then some higher frequencies, mid frequencies, higher frequencies, and even higher frequencies, and apply those last. All right. So since the low frequencies go in first, they are given time to travel to their destination before the next set of frequencies, the next set, the next set, and then the highest, which requires the least amount of time. I have here a simulation that is going to make this clear how it works. Okay? So just watch this. I'll get this going. Tell it to run. And then expand it so you can see it. Uh, and this is the perfect way to show it. Alright. Right now we're showing what happens when a click, that's all frequencies, simultaneously enter the cochlea, okay? This represents the bezel membrane, all right, from the um, uh, base to the apex, and uh, these represent the auditory nervous system uh, finally arriving at the site that produces uh, wave five, the inferior colliculus. Okay, so watch what happens here. As we start applying, uh, as, as we start, oh, wrong thing. As we start applying the stimulus, we're applying a click now, see? And so all frequencies are presented to the cochlea at once. Uh, now the high frequency has already arrived at its site of stimulation, while the other fr frequencies continue. And that highest frequency has already started its pathway, its, its journey down the auditory pathway. The other frequencies haven't even reached their site of stimulation yet. So the next highest frequency reaches its site of stimulation and uh, starts its travel down the auditory pathway, and then the next um, lowest frequency, the next lowest frequency, and here is the lowest frequency, finally reaches its place on the bezel of membrane, and now they're all started down their path towards the inferior colliculus. The high frequency gets there first, and look, wave five starts for, um, wave, wave five starts uh, for the highest frequency already. Though, when the, the lowest frequency is nowhere near it. And if it keeps on going, we end up with something like this. Okay, an asynchronous type of firing. That's the click. All right. Now I'm going to change this to show you what happens uh, when we use a chirp instead of the click in the chirp. Right, so now our stimulus is a chirp instead of a click and as I uh, kind of step through it we see what happens is the low frequencies are going in now. They're starting their trip down the, uh, down the cochlea. And they're given a chance to get to where they're going or get partially halfway to where they're going before the next higher set of frequencies comes in. And this is, this is timed just right. And now the next highest f set of frequencies comes in. And now the next and the next. So that once everything is there, you know, notice that they've all reached their point of excitation all at the same time. All right? They all fire at the same time. They all start heading down the auditory uh, nervous system at the same time. And they all arrive at the inferior colliculus, the generator of wave 5, at the same time. So 
wave fives are all generated simultaneously. They line up. And so the final waveform, which is the addition of all of those, is twice as robust of a wave five than we had when we had the click. So I hope I uh, have been able to demonstrate with that uh, the efficacy, just, just how that works um, in overcoming the timing problem within the cochlea. Okay? So what's the difference between the chirp and the click? Well, um, the similarities are that they are both broadband stimulations. They both have the same spectrum of frequencies. And they have the same intensity, the same calibration. Okay? The difference is uh, in the timing of the cochlea stimulation, right? It's a more efficient timed stimulation. Uh, uh, and it produces double the response. Okay? And we, and we, that's an advantage to us. When we can produce a higher amplitude response, we can get it faster because we have to do much less averaging. Remember that Jay Hall said once that uh, an ABR response is like a needle in a haystack. And in order to find it and, and end up with something that we can analyze, uh, we have to get rid of the haystack. The haystack is the physiological noise from the patient. Um, even when the patient is still and relaxed, or even sedated. There is still a lot of other physiological things going on uh, that overwhelm this response, which at best is a half a microvolt, one half of one millionth of a volt. So, uh, the noise overwhelms it, the other physiological noise. And so, we have to average and keep averaging sample after sample after sample. And what we hope will happen is that, that through averaging, the other noises, which are not time locked with the stimulus, they will uh, kind of average themselves out because they're random. But the actual response, time locked to the stimulus, will remain because it's not random. Well, and that's that needle in the haystack. We remove the noise by averaging before we could find the needle. In the case of the chirp stimulus, the needle is now not a needle, it's like a shovel. Okay? So we, have, we can do much less averaging to find it, to get rid of the haystack and find it, because it's so much bigger. All right? So the point is that uh, there are several benefits to using a chirp instead of a click if you're doing a threshold ABR. And uh, one of them is saving time. It saves a tremendous amount of time. It can be done in less than half the time it would take otherwise. Okay. Well, here's, here's a good example of a contrast. Uh, this was done, done on the Interacoustics Eclipse piece of equipment, uh, which is um, one of, to me, one of the highest technology uh, and, and, and best evoked potential systems on the market today. And here we used just a regular click, a traditional rare fraction click, and did a threshold search. And did a real good job, 70, 50, 30, 20, 10 dB, and we found uh, a response all the way down. Uh, so you would consider this a good case. This is a patient that, that, that certainly was either very calm or sedated. Uh, and then over here, uh, we do the same thing, but it is now a CE chirp. By the way, CE uh, does not have a significance to it. It is Klaus Elderbing, all right? Uh, and Klaus Elderbing was the, um, uh, the developer of the CE chirp okay, in Germany. Anyway, uh, but, but look at the, uh, the comparison. Look how much larger this response is. Same ear, says, trying to keep everything the same. All right? Look how much larger 
uh, this is at 70, 50, 30, 20, and 10 dB. Just easier to see and identify, and it took much less time to acquire this than it did that. Uh, so now we have two benefits. One is time savings, and two is uh, responses that are uh, larger, clearer, have better signal-to-noise ratio, easier to identify. Uh, and this would not only apply to what we call a broadband chirp, that would replace the click, but it also applies to narrowband chirps that would replace tone bursts. And here's, here, here they are. Here's 500 hertz, 1000 hertz, 2000 hertz, and 4000 hertz. And notice that they are narrow bands. Here, for example, the 500 hertz chirp uh, really is a band of 360 to 720. And even when we use tone bursts, they're not, even though they are tone bursts, they're, they don't end up being perfectly frequency specific, right? Because they are so brief uh, that they have, they have a spectral splatter, okay? Uh, uh, so the, the spectrums of the tone burst with their splatter and these narrow band chirps are very much the same, okay? Uh, but the same technology, the same idea of timing is used even in the narrow band chirp, where the lower frequencies are presented to the cochlea first and given a chance to get to where they're going but before the higher frequencies, okay? And so you don't stimulate the entire cochlea like you do would with a, a broadband chirp, but you stimulate that narrow area and you do a better job of stimulating that frequency specific area of the cochlea. Okay? Um, and so here's some examples of what they might look like. This isn't a comparison between the tone burst and the chirp, it's just showing you some real live chirp results. Uh, so here's uh, on the left ear, for example, we'll try it right here. Um, here, here we are with a 500 hertz narrow band chirp and uh, 80, 60, 40, 30, and no response that we could see at 25 or 20. So 30 was the threshold. And we would apply, just as we would with a tone burst, a correction to change that from um, NHL, which in this case would be 30 in the right ear, uh, to um, EHL, equivalent hearing loss. And that correction is normally 20 dB, could be greater in places where um, there is more ambient noise. But if we did that, this thresh, uh, if we applied 20, the threshold would be 10. Okay? Um, and on, on the um, left ear, we got this down to 25, very clear. Uh, and, and they repeat well, so you, you, you'd be able to see that. I have some other examples. And, and this would convert to a, a 5 dB actual EHL threshold. Okay, let's continue on. Here's the 1,000 hertz. Uh, and, you know, pretty clear down to threshold. And when you get close to threshold, they repeat nicely where you can easily identify that and hang your hat on it. This particular machine does replications automatically, all right? So you seldom, if ever, have to run any replications because you can press a, an icon and get both run superimposed here to make sure that it was repeatable. There's the 2,000 hertz, uh, typical 2,000 hertz uh, chirp response, and a 4,000 hertz chirp response. Uh, and so, and people that are using these are just saying, "Hey, I'm spending so much time, so I'm, I'm, sent, I'm saving so much time, and I'm getting results that I really, really can read, getting uh, good results even at threshold where I don't uh, have to do so many replications." Uh, Here's, here's a comparison, uh, and this comes from some of Todd Sutter's work. And uh, so here's a, a, a very typical 2000 hertz tone burst response uh, versus keeping all aspects the same, uh, same ear and everything, 
the 2,000 hertz narrow band chirp response versus the tone burst. And you can see, um, you know, approximately twice the amplitude and sometimes uh, even a little more. Now here's some interesting things. This comes from some of Jay Hall. This is uh, some of Jay Hall's slides that we're using here. This was a one-year, four-month-old boy with speech and language delay who failed a hearing screening in a nursery. Um, and um, so we wanted to see the efficacy, uh, how effective uh, using a, a chirp would be here. Okay? Uh, so he did a, a click response. This is an 85 dB rare fraction click, 21.1 per second. Uh, and here's the latencies. They all look kind of normal here. Um, and so there we are at 85 dB. He was able to get a response. You know, no, no problem at all there. Dropping down to 45, still using the click and the response there. And then down to 25, response there. Down to 20 with the click, response here. And then he said, I wonder what we would get if we just put a chirp in here uh, at 20 dB. And so this one is a chirp at 20 dB. Click and chirp at 20 dB. Uh, and you got what you would expect to get. You got the response, but it was a response that was larger, easier to identify. And then, uh, then went down below that with a click, 15 dB, got no response. Then used the chirp just to see if we could eke it out with the chirp, uh, and still no response. So. Uh, the threshold was 20. And the only thing that this shows is that it was a higher amplitude, more easily uh, a discernible response with the chirp. And he got it at a fraction of the time it would take to get it with the, narrow, with the, uh, with the click. Okay, so here's some, some frequency specific work. Uh, here we used a uh, 4000 hertz chirp, uh, chirp uh, to find threshold. Uh, notice that we use typically a much faster rate. Uh, and it, it's very typical to use something around 40 chirps per second. And uh, uh, there was a total of 2,600 uh, sweeps here. Uh, I, I mean total in all four ways. <laughs> uh, and a total time to find the threshold, 69 seconds. That's incredible. All right, a 4,000 hertz narrow band chirp uh, at 80 dB, 40 dB, 20 dB, and 15 dB. And look how many sweeps. This is at 40, 40 stimuli per second. Only uh, 684 sweeps, 456 sweeps, 570 uh, sweeps, 912 sweeps. You know, in other words, we got a response that was clear enough where, you know, we could stop early um, and, and move on. And you know, when you're in these situations, you may have the child sedated or sleeping temporarily. Speed is of the essence, and that's one of the beauties of the chirp, right? This comes from Jay Hall. Uh, 2,000 hertz chirp, right? A little harder to get, typically, uh, uh, with a, two, a 2,000 hertz tone burst. Okay, still um, a high click, a high stimulus rate, 37.7 is what he uses. This took him 61 seconds to find the threshold at 2,000 hertz with a chirp. 80, 35, 20, 80, and then smart, dropped all the way down to 35, and then went down to uh, 25, and then 20. Okay, um, and just nice, robust. Very robust. Look at this at threshold 20 dB, only 570 sweeps, and you know, hey, that response was there, and and uh, and 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 it repeated, and it was very easy to say, hey, I got it. I can hang my head on it. I can stop uh, stop accumulating a response here. Very very fast. Uh, so uh, it's it's an excellent utility for many many clinics. Here's a, here's a, a good case. Uh, here Jay was trying to experiment on the, again, the usefulness of the chirp. And so he started out with a, a tone burst. This is a 4,000 hertz conventional tone burst, 
just to try to throw a chirp in and see what would happen so you could see the difference right away. All right, started out at 85 dB, then 40, 30, just using conventional tone burst. And so at 30, couldn't really tell whether there's a response there with the conventional tone, to, uh, tone burst. I wouldn't know. I'd say there's a response there if that repeated, and of course there. But when I got to this, I don't really know. Uh, I'd have to do it again and again before I could say maybe there's something there because it didn't repeat well enough. So what he did is just switch to a chirp, okay, a 4,000 hertz uh, narrowband chirp, same intensity and clear as a bell and repeatable as a bell, okay, so no doubt there. All right, and then went down to 25 with the tone burst and again, I don't know if there's a response there. Uh, it didn't repeat well enough. I'd either, I either would have said, all right, no response, or if I really thought there was one, uh, or if I wanted to make sure there definitely wasn't one, I would have to do several more runs, superimpose those, and make a determination. Not necessary with the chirp, which always runs two runs automatically on the uh, Eclipse piece of equipment anyway, uh, because there was a clear response that I could, that I could uh, take there. And then staying with the chirp went down to 15 and no response. So the threshold, of course, is 25. And at 4,000, the correction would simply be uh, 10. All right? So a 25 dB threshold, NHL, would be an EHL threshold of 15. Okay? So, makes sense. Uh, and uh, this is backed up by uh, a lot of work. And so, um, you know, there, there's good scientific evidence that this is a viable and very, very useful utility for threshold ABR testing. There's a few more uh, features that are very, very helpful in threshold ABRs. And look at this response. And it doesn't matter whether it was a click or a tone burst that, re that, that produced that. But when you see that good a repeatability, you, you, you think the patient, well, it was either sound asleep or sedated. Yes, because when you get such good repeatability like that, where waveforms practically superimpose, then you have uh, very, very little residual noise. In other words, that's what's left of the haystack that, that, that wasn't averaged out. Otherwise, they would be perfectly superimposed. Well, while this piece of equipment runs, this is the um, Interacoustics Eclipse, um, while you're seeing the waveform average, at the same time you're able to watch a calculation and a plot of the residual noise level, the level of that haystack. And so drawing the test over time, we saw that level come all the way down. And when it's down to 40 nanovolts, um, it is said to be almost non-existent. Might as well stop testing. Uh, the residual noise is down that low. So it's nice to see that plotted during the test. It's just a helpful thing. At the same time that that's plotted during the test, uh, a calculation of something called the FMP uh, is made as well. So now we see a line being plotted in the other direction as time goes on, and that's the probability that a response exists, okay, um, using a comparison uh, of signal to noise ratio, right. Um, so this rises and once it hits this line then we have a 99 percent confidence level that a response exists and again might as well stop testing, right. This is why you can stop when these kinds of things exist. You can really statistically, mathematically, you can stop stimulating because you have a very, very valid response. Uh, it takes some of the subjectivity out of it, uh, though I wouldn't give up on subjectivity altogether. Okay, uh, so drawing the test, we have residual noise hopefully going down and probability of a response going up at the same time. Uh, just a good thing to have. And then they throw in something else. This is a wave producibility in percentage, you know? 
And it is generally considered that if you are running two waves simultaneously, and you always are in the background in this piece of equipment, then if they were to reach in their critical area, in this case, say, five to eight uh, milliseconds uh, around where wave five would be, if, if the reproducibility reaches 70%, you might as well stop because um, uh, it, it's mathematically practically impossible that a response does not exist. Okay, The probability of a, of a response existing is very, very high. So you have that wave reproducibility as well. When, and when you get to 70, I mean, most people would cut it off right there. So it, it's just very easy to watch this, this uh, reproducibility um, bar. Okay, so those are some com some helpful things during testing. Um, and here's something else. One more thing um, that makes a major major difference, especially when you're testing patients, maybe non-sedated pediatric patients, <coughs> patients who um, uh, may be um, moving or vocalizing during the test. In many conditions, situations, we'd say we can't test these patients, that we would have to sedate them. Well, what if we had a group of patients that you know could be calm enough to take this test? Uh, if you were to sit them there and have them watch uh, maybe a cartoon uh, without the uh, without the sound on, or if you were to blow bubbles or play blocks with them, they would be relatively calm. Now the calmer the better, uh, though naturally they're not going to just lay down, go to sleep for you and snore. Uh, <clears throat> well how would you get away with that? How could you get away with that? Well, there is a method called Bayesian waiting that really helps in this situation, and I'm going to try to explain how Bayesian waiting works. Okay. Uh, in, a, in any ABR, or any auditory evoked potential at all, remember the response is the needle, in this case maybe it's a shovel because it's a chirp, which that's a big advantage. Uh, and the residual noise, the other physiological noise going on, which overwhelms it initially, that's the haystack that we've got to get rid of. We get rid of it through averaging. Okay. But in a case where the patient is uh, maybe moving, maybe vocalizing, uh, sitting up instead of lying down, etc., then we are going to get, as we take samples of this EEG, we're going to get some of them that are, have a very good signal-to-noise ratio because at that particular moment the muscles are relaxed. And at another moment, we might get one that has a very poor signal-to-noise ratio because it, uh, the, the, the muscles are now uh, contracted at that time. What muscles? Jaw muscles, neck muscles, etc. Okay, so we're taking sample, 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 sample. And in the conventional system, we set a rejection level somewhere so, so that a sample that exceeds this particular level will not be included in the average because if it was it would corrupt the average uh, and you'd have a combination in your final result that was response from the patient plus physiological noise and you know uninterpretable or distorted we could misinterpret it uh, so we have to have a rejection level and we set that relatively low say 20, 15, 20, 25 um, um, microvolts Certainly, the response isn't that large. Those things are myogenic. Uh, and so, uh, oops, wrong way. Uh, where do I put that re uh, artifact rejection level? Well, I mean, uh, usually people leave it wherever the factory sets it. Uh, and the next thing is, every sweep is treated equal. The ones that are real good, the ones that are partially good, the ones that uh, are really terrible, but, the, you know, they got a lot of noise in them, 
but they don't exceed the rejection level. And the ones that are over the rejection level, well, they're just rejected. Uh, but the ones that are under it, whether they are good signal-to-noise ratio, low noise, or high noise, they're all treated equal as far as their contribution to the grand average. Okay? Um, so the low noise samples are burdened by the noisy samples, and they all add equally to the average. Okay? Uh, in fact, under these conditions, uh, the residual noise during the test, instead of falling, might even be rising and is corrupted by the noise. And you say, well, we can't do this test. The test is not valid because um, the patient needs to be sedated, was not calm enough. Uh, and so these responses that are below the rejection level, they contribute equally to the grand average, and the ones that exceed are not, do not contribute at all. That's traditional averaging. It's just one of the things with it. This is why we say patients have to be either nice and calm, sleeping or lying calmly, or they cannot be tested without sedation. Here's a way that they could be tested without sedation. Now, I don't mean the wild kid who is uh, yanking off the electrodes and storming down the hallway. Of course not. These are the patients that you can envision can sit and play calm enough to be able to do this test. Okay, within reason. Okay, so here you have the same situation, but using Bayesian weighting instead of traditional averaging. Well, first of all, we said where do we put the rejection level? Well, in the case of Bayesian weighting, we would set it much, much higher. Way, way up here, maybe around 80 microvolts. Or shut it off for that matter and don't reject any. Um, because we're not using rejection level as a criteria, all right? And we are going to actually use every sample. These, these are, are just the noise that's in a sample. Here's a high noise sample, here's a low noise sample. But the thing is, what we do in Bayesian weighting, <clears throat> as we collect these samples, we immediately analyze them instantly for their signal to noise ratio. And the ones that are low noise, Right? They're not all treated equal. The ones with low noise are, uh, like this one, they have high, it has a high contribution, like a 90% contribution, a high weight, a high contribution to the average, okay? Because it had good signal-to-noise ratio. This one has poor signal-to-noise ratio. Well, that's still added in. It still contributes to the average, but it has less weight, here a 10% weight versus a 90% weight. Uh, and even the sweeps that would have been over the um, artifact rejection level, which we had to keep low in order to keep down corruption of the average, uh, even they count, but much less, maybe 4%, 6%, 8%. But every single sweep counts rather than being rejected. Okay? So, basically, this scheme was chosen by Interacoustics for the Eclipse unit. Uh, and there are others, like Kalman, uh, Kalman filtering, which is very, very sim similar to Bayesian weighting, but Interacoustics chose Bayesian weighting because it is a solid, proven algorithm. Okay? Uh, and it will allow you uh, to uh, get acceptable results, uh, even good results, on patients that otherwise could not be tested. All right? I'm, I'm, I'm not saying, saying or trying to claim uh, that this puts an end to all sedation. If we were to claim that, that would be naive. But uh, it, it's certainly very, very useful. So in the right case, this can make a difference between, and it will make the difference between, uh, getting good results on non-sedated pediatric patients uh, versus no results at all, just all artifacts, uh, or a, um, 
a waveform that can't be interpreted. Okay? So the most significant noise source in evoke potential system, uh, uh, evoke potential uh, testing, uh, is normally not electrical noise and things like that, even though that, that could be a problem in certain environments, but it's the patient. So we either have to keep the patient relaxed, like this guy, or use weighted averaging, like Bayesian weighting. Uh, the systems that are able to do this, there's only two on the market. One is the uh, Interacoustics Eclipse, uh, which I recommend highly, and, and the other uses Kalman filtering, same basic concept, and that would be the uh, VivoSonic uh, Integrity, okay? which also has its application with non-sedated pediatric testing. One more thing, this is the last slide. <clears throat> an, um, an important thing, especially in environments like the operating room, um, and sometimes even in offices, uh, an important thing is to, uh, we talked about Bayesian waiting and all these things and using a stimulus that gives us a bigger response and, and, and save time, cleaner, cleaner waveforms, etc., etc. That all goes down the drain when our system is corrupted by electrical artifacts. And being in this business of evoke potentials for 35 years plus, I hate to say how many plus, uh, actually from the infancy of it, uh, I've had many, many situations where electrical interference has become a big, big problem either preventing you from running at all or totally corrupting the response. So there's, there's more electrical interference in there than there is actual response from the patient and, and it, then it's misinterpreted or not useful. Uh, well, I, I, uh, I, I had a situation in Gadsden, Alabama where I, I actually installed a system. I won't say what make and model it was. Uh, but uh, when I went to try it on myself, I heard a radio station in, in the actual inserts, right, along with the stimulus. And in the EEG, as I was watching the ongoing EEG, I could see the modulation, AM modulation, in, in the EEG. And I said, oh, this is going to be impossible. If there's nothing I could have done for this, there are techniques to reduce um, um, environmental noise, electrical noise, interference like that. But none of those would have worked in this case. This is the worst case I ever saw. So I got the audiologist and I said, do you have an AM radio transmitter around here? So she opened the curtains and right outside the window, biggest day monster, there it was. Okay. Well, that system wasn't going to work in there. <clears throat> so I brought back a biologic and a um, uh, and the Interacoustics Eclipse and the Grace and Stadler are there, okay? Trying to find something that, if anything, would work in there, okay? Um, and I, I ended up leaving the Eclipse there, though the other two did a great job because they have good noise immunity, Biologic and the Odera as well. The, uh, the Eclipse was extraordinary. There was no sign at all uh, in the EEG <coughs> of this radio station, what we call RF interference, RF for radio frequency. It all has to do with the design of the preamp, okay? And um, uh, I, I know you're not used to, as audiologists, looking at the specifications of preamps, uh, but the, uh, the, the preamp on this um, Eclipse device is extraordinary. It's extraordinary because it has a very, very high input impedance, which you want and has very, very high common mode rejection, another aspect that you want. Um, and it's, it's, it's very well shielded. And, and so uh, uh, it, it, it does a great job in electrically hostile environments. Uh, an, another important thing uh, and thing that could kill time and everything else because this this corruption of the response makes you average, 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 average trying to get rid of it. Sometimes you it locks into the signal, time locks into the signal, and you can't get rid of it. Uh, so, anyway, uh, th this is one of the best preamps that I, that I have found. Uh, 
and as I say, the Audera preamp uh, that was designed by Nicolet, that's the Audera uh, preamp is also very good, and uh, the Biologic is, is one of the standards of the industry. Uh, it, does a, it does a great job with noise as well. Okay, well that wraps it up uh, for this instructional video. I hope that that has helped you uh, and now you uh, realize um, the advantages of using the CE chirp, both broadband chirps and narrowband chirps. You wouldn't use these for adult diagnostic ABRs, ECOGs or anything like that or VIMPs. Uh, you would use them on uh, cases where you're finding threshold. Okay, And then then they're very, very, very efficient. Uh, people who use them regularly swear by them. And uh, uh, so, anyway, hope to see you sometime in the future for another instructional video from Metacoustics. Goodbye.